Well, here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Oh my goodness, this is episode two of How to Be an Adjuster. Pretty excited uh, to be here again. Been thinking all week about what in the world I could be talking about and how I could uh, just explain to you how it is that I became an adjuster. And I realized after I sat back a while and I said, man, there is a lot of information. And I hope, I hope I can explain this to you without actually making you bored. Because <laughs> I tell you, it's not boring. This is a really great job. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of information. I'm going to be going over a lot of this with you. Uh, you'll be able to see my notes. You'll be able to see uh, the information that I have gathered. And hopefully, uh, if you're interested, I might post that to, uh, to the blog here, blog, uh, so that you can have. I think it would be a good information source for those. Uh, you certainly are welcome to, to look at the, uh, the video over and over again if you'd like to gather notes. But uh, let's, uh, let's get started. So... The big question everybody says, and the same question I get a lot of times when people, when I show up at people's door or I give them a call for the first time, is I, they say, what is an adjuster? Well, that being said, there are three types of adjusters. Maybe I'll get through the first one today. I don't want to bore you guys with the length of this video, but certainly uh, there's lots of information here. So the first type of inf uh, adjuster that I'm going to talk about is a staff adjuster. Well, first of all, I'll introduce all three of them to you. A staff adjuster, an independent adjuster, and a public adjuster. Now, a lot of guys go, public adjuster? Aren't those those crooked guys that just out there ripping people off? Well, you know, that is, a, you know, they get a bad reputation sometimes. But that being said, I'm going to go through that at a later time uh, to talk to you about a public adjuster. So that being said, the definition of an adjuster is... An insurance adjuster or claims adjuster is a person who investigates claims to determine how much or if your insurer will pay for the damage or loss. Now, that being said, that's kind of tricky because when you see that or if, that all has to do with coverage. Coverage is one of the most important things that you need to, uh, to know before you can pay for a claim. So we'll talk about a staff adjuster, okay? So a staff adjuster works full-time, full-time for one insurance firm, adjuster firm exclusively. Okay, so let me explain what that means. That could be, uh, say you wanna work for State Farm. If you become an employee for State Farm, you are a staff adjuster. Staff adjusters are employees. They will receive uh, a salary, so a salary, they'll also receive benefits. And occasionally, you know, they might receive a bonus, uh, potentially continue education, and they also might receive a pension, uh, life insurance, and health insurance. So there's lots of perks to it. Uh, definitely uh, one of those pluses as far as if you like a stability of a job, something that's going to be there for you every day, you put in your 40 hours and you're done. All right, so a staff adjuster works full time for that one adjuster. Remember, I told you that's just or for one adjusting firm. So you can work for any insurance company, but only one. Uh, but you also respond to those claims for only just that one company. So if you're working for State Farm, you're an employee for them. You can't go work for Geico. Sorry, just can't do it. You're working for that one company and that's it. All right, so they also can work for many different types of insurance, as well as an independent adjuster can also do that as well. But a staff adjuster can do auto, it can do property, which is homes, uh, boats, lots of other things like that. And you also can do medical claims. Okay, when I was a staff adjuster for State Farm, I was working auto liability and auto total loss. Okay, so that was vehicle claims. I didn't do anything else. 
Uh, I just worked those. And, and each time I worked for those companies, uh, I was working just one part. So I worked liability. That's it. Liability. Just And liability uh, insurance would have been who's at fault for that accident. So that's pretty critical. There's a, you, you don't jump around when you're doing liability. You just stand at one thing. And every time you talk to someone is you're learning uh, or you're talking to them about this liability. Who was at fault for the accident? Okay, so that's one part of that when I was working inside. The other part uh, was I was working for total loss. So technically, okay, and this is where it gets kind of tricky. I was an independent adjuster working for uh, or pretending to be a staff adjuster, but I was not technically a staff adjuster, but I'll go into that. That's actually really complicated. I don't want to confuse you on that. All right, so as far as a staff adjuster goes, um, you're going to have uh, several benefits to being that staff adjuster. Again, like I mentioned, it's going to be that salary that you get all the time. You don't have to worry about it. You get your paid time off and, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of benefits to it. The disadvantages that I see uh, that come alongside a staff adjuster is going to be that you are not going to make a whole lot of money. Okay, they don't want to pay a lot of money for these staff adjusters. They just want to have that dependable group of people that are going to show up on time, be there when they need them, and pay them that basic salary. Typically, uh, going to see somebody make about fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year, with potentially over a long period of time maybe being seventy, eighty thousand dollars. But to pretty much staying in that same mode of doing the same job over and over again, day in and day out, 40 hours a week. They um, normally don't work overtime. Occasionally they do when we have a catastrophe or a big event. Uh, that would be an option. But most of the time, it's just 40 hours a week. You're normally sitting inside an office working at a desk and you're just putting in that 40 hours. Uh, one of the funny things that I noticed when I was working inside, uh, we worked as an independent, but then also had uh, staff adjusters in the same building. Uh, and I remember the mass exodus, the mass exodus when five o'clock came around and they just took off. I mean, it was just 501. There was not a soul to be found. It was they were gone. So that's the type of mentality. And that's not just picking on State Farm. That's really any any insurance company that has a staff adjuster, just like your agent. You walk into your agent's office at five after five, doors are closed, everybody's locked up and there's no one around. So that's typically what a staff adjuster is, is they're there to work 40 hours a week. Okay. Well, I am I talked about that pretty quickly. Um, that's not really my forte and that's not really what this is all about. But uh, that is one portion of an adjuster that you could uh, uh, potentially go and get a job to do. Uh, there's the nice thing about a staff adjuster also is they're, uh, they're local. They stay local. They don't travel around a lot. Uh, you might be able to transfer to another location, possibly head over to, uh, you know, if you decided, hey, I'm, I'm moving to Illinois and I really would like a job. Well, guess what? Bloomington, Illinois, head of State Farm. So you could, you could go there and work there. Uh, they have several other offices as well across the state. So yeah, you could put in for a transfer and, and then move eventually over to those locations. So definitely some flexibility there if you wanted to have uh, a job that was consistent and there for you each day. So now I am going to talk about uh, being an independent adjuster. Independent is what I am. Okay, and the main benefit to being an independent adjuster is you are self-employed. Self-employed means you are your own boss. Uh, it's just something that you, uh, uh, I don't know if you have ever done this before or ever thought about it, but uh, wake up in the morning, you can decide, hey, I want to get going at eight o'clock or I want to get going at nine o'clock. Uh, maybe I want to get going at seven. So there's an opportunity to make your own hours and choose those hours accordingly. The part that I like about being an independent adjuster is I make my own schedule. So no more waking up in the morning and saying, oh man, I just can't believe I got to go to this dead end job every single day. I'm going to this dead end job. I hate my job. Well, <laughs> not anymore. You wake up in the morning, you're excited. You want to get your job done because the more you work, the more you make. Just remember that. That's really the same for any 
self-employment job, uh, when you are your own boss, you make the money which you decide to put into it. So if you want to make a lot of money, you put a lot of effort into it. If you're okay with making, you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, you're just going to put in the effort to get that. But to potentially make two hundred thousand dollars a year, hundred and fifty thousand, whatever you would like to make, the more you work, the more you make. Now, I know you're all dying to hear how much money can I make? You know, I threw a number out there. Uh, there are quite a few guys making very good money being an independent adjuster. So just keep that in mind. Now, it's not easy money. I don't want to sway those people into thinking this is an easy job. To make $200,000 a year or $150,000 a year or $100,000 a year all has the amount of work that you put into it will get you to that level. Now, that being said, there are some independent adjusters who, man, they struggle. They got started and then they, they, you know, they put about halfway into it and they make $60,000 a year. And they're wondering, man, I just can't make any money doing this job. This is a dead-end job. This isn't working. Well, being an independent adjuster is not for everybody. I think that that's the greatest, uh, what do you call that? Greatest delusion of this business or being self-employed is that it's easy money. So if you look at most corporate America, you look at the big guys, you know, the guys up there making $500,000 a year. Do you think they got there just by kind of hanging out and going, hmm, I think today I'm going to make $500,000 a year. No, they didn't just decide that. Every one of those guys put in the effort, put in that effort and said, I'm not going to let anybody tell me what I can and cannot do. I'm going to get it. And if that's what you seek for, that's what you want, more power to you. You can, you can get it. I'm not sure that I want to be in that route. But as far as uh, what I do here, I work hard, I get paid well, and then it's enjoyment. I have the ability to spend that money how I want to spend it. I have the ability to take vacations when I want to. And I also have the ability to make sure that that job will be there tomorrow for me if I want it. All right. So Let's uh, go back to this. Independent adjusters work as contractors for, number one, multiple insurance companies or third-party administrators. I'm going to explain that a little bit to you. Multiple insurance firms, so that's who you're going to work for when you go and uh, start working. A firm is who you're going to work through. You can't go directly to the insurance company as an independent adjuster. I'll talk a little bit more of that later, but that's going to be a producer that can go and go directly to that insurance company. So an adjuster of either type, okay, so either type being uh, a person, a contractor that works for multiple insurance firms or a third-party administrator, that adjuster can work independently, that adjuster can work for a firm, or you can also work for multiple firms. So remember when I talked about the staff adjuster, I said you can only work for one insurance company. Well, an independent adjuster can work for multiple insurance companies. Now, also you have to go through the firm, okay? So here, I'm gonna explain the firm. Okay, so when you hear the term adjusting firm or firm, okay, they are entities formed to coordinate and organize the services of adjusters for the insured and the insurance adjuster. Okay, so the firm is going to be the company that handles your work. So if I want to find work, I have to go find a firm. Okay, because like I mentioned, a producer is the, is the one that can say, hey, Mr. Insurance Company, can I come and work for you? I want to solicit business to handle your claims. Okay, that's a producer. I am not a producer. Difference between that is I'd apply for a license to be a producer. A producer is going to be your insurance agent. Insurance agents are producers. They're the ones who talk directly to the insurance company and can sell insurance for them. So they're actually acting as like the insurance company. So anyways, we're not going to talk about the producer. That's a totally different venue and I'm not a producer, so we're not going to go that route. So as far as if adjusting firms, 
If adjusting firm obtains work from the insurance company or the carrier, okay, so I'm going to use that word carrier because that's a short form for instead of insurance company, they're the carrier, okay, so that's another term that you'll need to learn. So the carrier is, is basically State Farm, Geico, Progressive, Nationwide, all these different, those are, those are insurance companies, but that's also called a carrier. So the firm obtains work. So here they are all by themselves. They call up Mr. Insurance Company and, they, and the insurance company says, absolutely, we'd love to hire you, we'd love to have you handle our claims. Well, that insurance company then starts sending claims to that insurance firm. <laughs> now, the funny thing about the firm is what if they sat there and said, oops, I don't have anybody to do my work. <laughs> well, guess what? They're going to have to be the one who actually goes out and does the work or they're going to have to hire somebody to do the work. That's where I come in. Now, an insurance firm could also be me. I could actually become an insurance firm. That would be, again, the producer license. I could solicit for my own insurance work, call up the insurance company and say, sure, I'd love to work for you, but I would have to have that producer's license. Now, I can get both. I can be a producer and an insurance adjuster. So that's something you could do if you really wanted to branch out to get some more work. Now, we're gonna talk again about uh, what the adjusting firm also does. They obtain the work from multiple insurance companies. Okay, so they don't just go to State Farm or just one other insurance company. They go to all of them, as many as they can find, and they solicit business. Now, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, can, I, can we do your insurance uh, claims here for this insurance company? That insurance company may say, no, I'm only going to give you a few of those. I can't, can't give you a whole bunch. We got somebody over here doing it too. Now, hear what I just said? The insurance company hires multiple firms to handle their claims. Now, the reason why they do that is because they're not sure if this firm over here is going to be reliable. Okay, so the last thing you want to do is put all your eggs in one basket. That would be not good. <laughs> so that insurance company says, hmm, I'll give you, say I'll give you 50 claims. We'll see how you do. Or maybe I'll give you claims for a quarter and we'll see how you do. Okay, so in that quarter, three months, uh, they test them out. Well, over here, company B firm, they just gave 50 claims to them as well. And then in that quarter, also, they'll be testing them to see how fast they turned them in, how many errors were in those files, if they got any complaints from insureds. Uh, that would be all things that would be very important for that uh, insurance company to pay attention to. Now, at the end of that quarter, they might go, hmm, company A seems to be doing pretty good over here. I kind of like the way that they've been handling the claims. Now they keep track of all those numbers. And they say, hey, how fast did you call the insured? Wow, you called them in one hour from receiving the, the claim. Or you got that, uh, that claim inspected within 48 hours. Wow, that's fast. And the most important thing is you got that claim turned in the same day you inspected it. Can you believe that? Now, I make that sound pretty big, but... Company B might get it in the next morning. Not the same day, but the next morning. Well, that's not what the insurance companies are looking for. They're looking for something that's super fast, super fast, and something that would be uh, efficient, makes the customers happy, and they get it in when, when they're supposed to. So that's going to be where the insurance company then decides, you know what, I kind of like company A, but maybe we'll keep company B over here. We'll keep them handy just in case we get really busy. Okay, so you guys understanding that, figuring that out? Okay, so the firms are really important because they can provide multiple insurance company work. Okay, what does that mean to you? Pay attention to this. This is where you need to pay attention. <laughs> so let's say I have Mr. Firm over here. And Mr. Firm says, okay, I actually only work for a couple insurance companies. Well, okay, so you sign up with this firm and they start giving you some claims. Now, maybe they only have a couple for this insurance company and a couple for this insurance company per week. 
So maybe you only have five or six claims for those two insurance companies. Well, what if you need more work? What if that's not enough? Which it isn't. <laughs> but you're sitting there going, hey, can I have some more work? And they're going, hey, man, that's all I got. Sorry. Okay, well, what if company B has 10 insurance companies? And say they only can get you a couple claims every, every week or so from each of those insurance companies. Well, guess what? Now you're looking at 20, 30 claims per week for that firm. Now, you haven't even talked about working for this firm. We're talking about just one firm that has 10 insurance companies that might get you two claims per week from that insurance company or from each insurance company. That's a lot of work. And it's probably going to be way more than you want to do every single week. So you, as an independent adjuster, may say, hmm, I'm not sure that I want to put all my eggs into this one insurance company firm or insurance firm. I might want to just say, hey, maybe I'll favorably go over to this guy and make them happy. Okay, and that's what I did. So I worked for a few different firms, tried it out, and then finally decided that there was one firm. Well, actually, I have two firms that I work primarily for. And that firm, those firms provide me enough work for me to, to not really need any more work. Now you say, how in the world is that possible? Well, that's because that one firm I was talking about, this one over here, they have about 15 to 20 different insurance companies. Now I don't work for all of those, but they have some of the bigger ones and they keep me very busy. So that's a good thing to find is that, hey, why would I want to work for company B if they've got an ABC insurance company that you've never heard of? I don't want to work for them. Uh, number one, because a lot of times their fee schedules or the way they pay is a lot less. So they might be a new company, a new firm that's getting out that hasn't been, been around a long time. So now they're working for Joe Schmo uh, insurance company and they're just not paying that much. So they kind of have to pay their dues and go through that process for a little bit before they can get the big dogs. Now that's, that's important. So for you to work for multiple insurance companies, Go with the company B because then you can uh, you can have uh, a whole lot more work with them. Now your firm, the ones that you work for, are your point of contact with a carrier. Okay, what I mean by that is is that you technically are not an employee of that insurance company, so you got to be really careful about that relationship. Uh, I heard somebody say back uh, a while back they said uh, um, you can't spend our money. So that was the carrier, you know, talking to us. One of the managers said that to me. And he said, we don't want independent adjusters spending our money. <laughs> and I'll go over that a little bit more in detail later. But, but that's kind of funny because uh, they've made it very clear to us that we are not the employees of the insurance company. And therefore, we can't tell the insurance company what to do. Our job solely is to say, okay, Based on my investigation that I saw here, there is damage here, okay? And based on my investigation, this is the estimate that I've prepared based on the damage that I've seen. So that's really important. I'm not telling them, you need to pay this. Because <laughs> number the, the number one thing that you have to remember about the insurance company is they don't tell us what the coverage is. And the reason why is they don't want us coming out there and making predetermined coverage decisions before we write up an estimate. So I'll go that in, into more detail a little bit later. There's lots of details about that. So primarily, uh, they're our point of contact, meaning when I talk to the firm, they normally have a liaison, which is somebody who works for the insurance company, which is a manager that they're allowed to communicate to. So if something goes wrong with a claim, a lot of times the firm will contact me and they'll say, hey, can you, uh, maybe you could reach out to the desk adjuster uh, that works for the insurance company. Uh, maybe you could just send me a note in the file and then I'll talk to the manager. So it's kind of like a throughput, just from you know going from here to there in order to get to it. It's kind of weird that we can't go directly there. Uh, we, we can ask them questions. We can say, oh, I came upon this when I was inspecting. Uh, how do you want to handle this? So it's kind of like you're still in that submissive role to that to that desk adjuster. So you want to be careful about that relationship because they can 
they can say some bad stuff about you too, throw you under the bus or whatever, you know. So <laughs> you got to be careful about that. But no, there you can actually call them and talk to them, but you can't tell them what to do. So it's kind of a weird arrangement. So most of the time you talk to your firm, You, if you have any questions, you have a manager that's been assigned to you. Uh, so you can call them and say, hey, you know, I've, I got a, I got something going on here. And the manager might be able to say, yeah, why don't you go ahead and call the desk adjuster and get some advice on that uh, so that we can move forward and make a right decision on that. So that's kind of how that relationship works. Now, here's the most important part about the firm relationship. OK, so they don't work for free, guys. I hate to break it to you. So they take 40 percent of everything that is billed. Okay, I know, sit back there and go 40%, man, that is a lot and it. It's almost half, so think about it. Everything you make, they almost make half of what you make. So let's say you got Mr. Super Adjuster making 150,000, that's what he's taken home after the 40% has been removed. So what the, the pfft, Man, I lose sleep over this sometimes. But <laughs> the point is, they made almost the same amount of money just off of me. In order to do the job, as I go through the firm, they made about the, almost the same amount of money. So they're almost double billing to the insurance company to pay me my 60%. Okay, so think about that for a minute. Mull over that and see how it feels. Because I sit there and I go, man... These firms could have upwards of 500 to 1,000 adjusters working for them. Now, they're not all making big money, but think about it for a minute. If they make 40% of every single dollar you make, okay, or they bill, sorry, it's almost half of, you almost make the same salary as I'm making. Multiply that by 1,000 adjusters. That's a lot of money. These guys are doing a lot of money. So... That being said, they have a, a lot of responsibility there too. So I don't want to make you know light of the fact that you know these guys are are uh, you know just smoozing it and taking all the money and you know just running to the bank. No, because think about it. The first thing that goes wrong, the first thing that goes wrong. Let's say I'm a bad adjuster and I mess up a, a file really bad. Okay, that firm is now going to pay for it, <laughs> meaning not my money, but it's going to have to take the heat for what I did. Okay, so think about that just for a minute. The firm wants to make sure they're hiring the best people solely for what I just mentioned. Could you imagine having a bunch of dummies working for you? I mean, really, and they all mess up the claims. And then the insurance firm says, well, sorry, guys, we, we had a whole bunch of messed up files. Uh, you have to take them anyways. <laughs> no, that's not going to work. OK, so you've got to you got to think a little bit about that. That firm is going to be looking for the best people, the best job, the best files, the easiest to read files, the best photos, you know, over and over and over again. OK, so this is the part that I think a lot of adjusters don't get and they mess up. It's because they're wondering why they're not working and they're wondering why they're not being called to do these claims. Um, I would look back at yourself and look at maybe even talk to another adjuster and say, hey, can you look over a file here of mine and tell me what you think? Because probably nine times out of 10, the reason why you're not working is because your files are sloppy. Your files are not complete. Your files weren't thorough. OK, you took bad photos, maybe you forgot some photos. OK, so that's where I was saying you have to really tweak your skills in order to get all of this in place so that you can get the best file forward and then be able to send it to the firm. All right. So I talked about that money. So that's uh, that's a big thing. OK, now occasionally. So think about this for a minute. Occasionally you will get a bonus. And what I mean by that is that uh, I have received in the past uh, where they changed my contract for one month and said, OK, we're going to pay you 70 percent. That was a that was a treat. And so I worked really, really hard. I, I pushed through really, really hard with as many claims as I could that month because I knew 
then I would be paid 70% of what I made or what I billed for. Okay, so that sometimes happens. Sometimes you'll even get uh, bonuses for a year where they'll change your fee schedule for a year. That's huge. Think about that. It's 10% more of your entirely yearly salary. I don't know many people that get 10% raises in this business. That's just not heard of. Now, the reason why they do those uh, types of raises is because they're thankful for who I am or what I've done. Now, one of the risks that they know is out there is if another firm comes forward and says, hey, do you want to come work for us? Uh, we're paying 70% all the time. Wow, you'd be sitting there going, man, that's killer. You know, but you want to be careful because you want to be loyal. Loyalty in this business to the firms is very, very important. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get into catastrophe uh, claims, because that's where it's going to, the loyalty is going to really pay off. I'll kind of give you a teaser, but um, they will call you if you're loyal, meaning call you for catastrophe work. So if a big event happens and you're out there and you're like, yeah, I really want to go, you know, because you don't know, make a lot more money doing catastrophe work. Uh, but what if you're standing there on the phone going, I really want to go, I really want to go. Uh, but then they say, mm, no, we're not really interested in, in sending you out. Well, you never really know why. But the reason why is because you weren't really loyal to them when you were doing your everyday work like your daily work. And so they knew that you were shopping around or you're doing other claim work for other firms. Um, that loyalty is super important. Okay, so, so it's really nice. Now, when I, I just tell you a little bit about mine, is that when a catastrophe happens, this company, that one company I work for, uh, they call me every storm and say, would you like to go? And that's just really great. That's an honor. Uh, sometimes I say no, and sometimes I say yes, just depending on how I feel at that time. If I feel, feel like I'm a little stressed and I've had some hard, hard work at home, it's been really busy, maybe I've had a local hailstorm that's really kept me busy and I'm just swamped and I just need a break, uh, that might be a time where I say, no, I'm going to pass on that, on that catastrophe storm. Uh, catch me next time, but I really appreciate you calling. Um, so yeah, and then that next time I may not be as busy and I'll say, sure, yeah, absolutely, I want to go. And then they'll, they'll send you on your way. So, so that's, that's that loyalty that I was talking to you about. Um, that's super, super important. Uh, treat people how you'd like to be treated and they'll, they'll come back and scratch you later. So <laughs> scratch you back later. <laughs> so, all right. One uh, real important part also about being a, an independent adjuster regarding these firms is that you can work for as many firms as you want. So when I first started, uh, I did solicit a lot of firms when I was first getting started. So that's gonna be one of the, your key points. Uh, as a new adjuster, you wanna get out there and start calling them all. Now I'm telling you, there's a ton of firms and some of them are local, meaning some locally right there in your state or even in your, in your own town, uh, local insurance companies. Some um, are gonna be nationwide and what I mean by nationwide is that not the, not the insurance company nationwide, but the firms have claims in a lot of states. I mean, we're talking 80, 70 to 80 percent of the states they're covering claims in. So for each carrier. So, for instance, state farms everywhere. OK, so wouldn't it be great to work for a firm that handles state farm claims? Because if I ever decided to move, then I could literally still work for the same firm you know, built that reputation with the firm and they really like me. If I decide to move, I just say, hey, by the way, um, I'm moving to Colorado. Can you hook me up with some claims over there? Uh, and they'll be like, hey, yeah, you're one of our best adjusters. Why not? Sure. And you might actually boot out somebody uh, that is maybe not their favorite adjuster. And what I mean by that is, is that they want the best adjusters. So think about it. There's always a line of where you sit as an adjuster. Are you, you know, third down from the top or are you in the middle or are you down at the bottom? So you got to look at that and say, OK, if I'm a good adjuster and I'm right up here at the top, then really, if I go somewhere else, th that ranking still applies. So I might go into Colorado, but then they might have, you know, only three adjusters there. Well, maybe you're one of the better ones of those three. 
Well, how that works, and the firms don't tell people this, but I know it works because I've heard it from managers, is they'll say, you know, you're a better adjuster than the other guy that we have locally. They may not tell me his name, they just, they might. And they'll say, you know what, I, I, you know, I don't mention this to him, but I think I'm going to start pushing more claims your way. So they, what they do is they just kind of ease off a little bit with the other guy and they're not giving him as much. And, um, and you know, they'll still give him some because they're thankful to have him there, but you'll be the primary or maybe the secondary and you'll get more than the third. Okay, so see how that works? So again, that comes back to performance. You perform, you do your best work all the time. You're going to make people happy. And so you just want to, you know, you want to make them happy. You don't want to frustrate them. If you are your own boss, you are there to solicit work from these firms and uh, you can make decisions or choices of who to work for. So it's important for you to remember that. So what I mean by that is that if, uh, let's say you work for company A over here and uh, you look at their fee schedule, okay? What I mean by that is what the insurance company they're working for decides to pay. That's called a fee schedule. I'll go over that a little bit more a little later. Uh, that fee schedule tells you how much you're going to make. And then you have to look at 60% of that amount. So each insurance company pays differently. I don't think I've ever seen a, an insurance company's uh, firm or a, basically fee schedule to be exactly the same as somebody else's. So it's real important to read that carefully because you don't want to spend all your time working for somebody and then find out you're making a really crummy fee schedule or re real crummy pay. So that's, uh, that's hard. I've learned that the hard way, so trust me, we all have to do that. And sometimes when you're first working, you may have to work for those not so perfect uh, fee schedule persons or, or insurance companies just to get your feet wet, to get inside there, uh, do some work for them and, and to gain some experience. So we've all done it, got to do it. But as you get more and more experienced and your product gets more and more refined, uh, it's going to be the th most important, one of the, well, I keep saying the most important. There's so many important things, so please don't, <laughs> don't misunderstand me. There's, there's a lot of important things, but I keep saying that a lot. Um, so when you work for, for those companies, after you've developed, uh, you know, you find out that they are paying well and uh, maybe one over here is not paying so well. So that might be the time for you to say, you know, I appreciate your business. I'm getting a little busy here uh, in this, uh, uh, the work that I'm doing here. You don't have to say, well, you don't have a very good fee schedule. <laughs> you don't say that. But you say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of busy here. Uh, maybe you could hold off on my claims for a little bit with your company and I'll give you a call back if I get some time freed up. I think people tend to figure out what that means and that is that uh, you're, you're not too thrilled with what you're making with them or they're just not providing the amount of uh, claims that you're hoping for. So, you know, one uh, once a week is not a company I want to work for. But if I can get 10, 15 from a company every week, that's the type of company you want to you want to work for. So that's uh, that's good work. All right. So. Uh, when you're working for lots of firms, then you can decide who you want to work for based on, uh, hey, this, this company does pretty good. They treat me really well, I like the managers, so I think I'm going to keep working for this guy. This one over here, they're okay, but they're not the best, but uh, I do like their managers and I like their fee schedules. So there'll be, there'll be you know, times where you have to negotiate a little bit in your head, not with them because that's not negotiable. Um, they, they pay what they pay. You can't argue with that. Uh, but, you know, there might be something where you say, I kind of like this one. They do pretty good and they treat me well and uh, they're there for me when times are slow. I think I'll hang out with them. So uh, that works out really well. All right. So uh, the second part uh, of an insurance adjuster is that you can do work. Uh, so independent adjusters work as contractors for multiple insurance firms or third party administrators. OK, so I'm going to go over a little bit about what is a third party administrator. OK or TPA, another short form. Now, a third party administrator is a company that provides operational services such as claim processing and employee benefit management under contract to another company. Insurance companies and self-insured companies awful, often sorry, outsource their claims processing to third parties. 
Okay, so that was a crazy explanation, but here, I'm gonna explain it to you. So when you call up, uh, let's say for State Farm, for instance, and you call up a claim, uh, that, um, think about it, how frustrated you would be if you called up and said, you know, I call up and say, I got a claim. I mean, my house is flooding, my toilet ran over or whatever. And you call up and it says, I'm sorry, but we're very busy right now. Um, the whole time is five minutes. I think you would freak out. You'd be like, my toilet is flooding. It's flooding my house. What do I do? I'm calling my insurance. And people, that's what they do. They call their insurance company, which instead of calling a plumber or, you know, or calling their uh, somebody who knows what to do, they call the insurance company. So what if there was a five minute wait? You'd be like, oh my goodness, why am I paying my money to this insurance company if they can't even answer their phones? So what happens is they hire either independent adjusters, uh, potentially a temp service. Uh, there's lots of those types of people that are third party administrators to answer those phones. Now, first important part of, of uh, that type of role is that they're non-committal. Okay, there's no coverage a lot of times talked about. Uh, they kind of just, they're data processing type people. So think about it. You call, you call in and in 20 seconds you're connected with somebody and you're calling at 10 o'clock at night. Isn't that amazing that you can actually call at 10 o'clock at night and report a claim? Or sometimes three o'clock in the morning. You know, those funny commercials is like, who are you talking in the middle of the night? Jake. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> so the, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. When I was working at State Farm, we did wear khakis and sometimes we wore uh, red shirts. So <laughs> it, it is a real thing. So <laughs> it's a funny thing. But anyways, now, What's the other one? Liberty Mutual? I don't think I want to dress as an ostrich. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll skip that one. <laughs> so, so anyway, so yeah, so the, the point is, is that when you call up for that claim, you want somebody to answer the phone. And so third party administrators are basically hired people or temp positions to, to basically uh, handle the claims processing. Hey, what's your name? What happened? Okay, is this the right address? Okay, you still live here. Okay, it looks like your policy is covered, you know, not covered, but is current. Uh, you've got coverage there, it looks like. I can't go over any of that coverage with you, but it does look like you have coverage. Oh, and I'm able to help you with uh, calling out a remediation company. That would be somebody to come out to dry out that mess. Uh, I, I don't mind if I uh, put you on hold just for a split second, I'll get them on the phone. And then literally for just a couple minutes, uh, they've already assigned it. They come back on the phone and they go, okay, we got it set. Somebody will give you a call here shortly and uh, get you arranged for some emergency services, start drying out that water. And, you know, they talk a little bit more about, you know, confirm your birthday, confirm, you know, your address and all that stuff. And then you hang up and you feel like you've actually got, uh, you know, somebody on the phone that handled your problem and you feel like things are really cool. Well, the great thing is you get off the phone and literally about 20 minutes later, the remediation company calls and, and says, hey, can we be out there in the morning or is it that bad? You need us out there now. And you're just thinking, oh man, this is the best insurance company in the whole wide world. Well, I can guarantee you it's not a staff adjuster. No staff adjusters are sitting in bed snoozing until their time at nine to five until they have to get there. So that's where uh, independent adjusters handle a lot of the third party stuff as well. Um, to just get in there and handle the ins and outs or the busyness of the business. So one thing I did notice is uh, when, when I was working uh, at State Farm is they gave us no stability as far as how long our job would last. Sometimes those jobs in that location, they might only be a three month assignment. Sometimes they might even be just six months. And if we were really lucky, we might get a year. So it was really uncertain. And the reason why they did that is we weren't employees. So State Farm could say, okay, right now this month, we just had an event occur and we need 500 adjusters in, in Dallas. So can we, you know, firms, hello. And that's what they do is they send out all the phone call messages to those firms and say, we need as many as you can get, we need 500. How many you got? And they might only have 100. So they'll call the next firm and say, okay, how many? We need 500. How many can you give us? Oh, we can get you 100 too. So that's how it works. But then in a month, 
after they've handled, handled all the influx of those claims and things have started to slow down a little bit, they'll say to the firms, well, guys, we've got to let you know, half the bunch go because we got, we're pretty much caught up, but we still need half of them. So unfortunately, if you're one of the unlucky ones, uh, you go home after 30 days. So that's how, it, but that's how they work. The system works that way because uh, these big insurance companies don't want to have a thousand employees out there in one location and, and half of them twiddling their thumbs because an event didn't occur. So they take, uh, you know, they'll, they'll basically use a, kind of like a temporary positions uh, temporary adjusters and say, hey, we'll give you 30 days at this location. You want to come? And they pay you pretty good. Uh, some may say, hey, we want 30 days. Some will say three months. Some will say six months. And some will say a year. In fact, I know a buddy of mine, he was hired with a five-year contract. So what a, what a dream. Now, he's not thinking that right now because he's tired after about three years of doing this and, uh, you know, working for the same company, doing the same job. So but just understand that a lot of times when they call in, you're talking to an independent adjuster. You're talking to a TPA. Okay, so does that make sense? I hope everybody's got that. All right, well, I am going to stop here because the video has been going on quite a long time. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, I want to get to the public adjuster side. Um, actually, let's go ahead because I think it, because it's three types, I want to explain each, each type and I'll try not to make this last one too long. So a public adjuster. So these are the guys uh, that, um, boy, I, tell you, I don't even know how to speak to this in the, in the most positive light. Uh, but t I tend to, um, I don't have a whole lot of, of like for public adjusters. Now, when I was in Florida, I had uh, some experience with some public adjusters. And so that's maybe where I've been tainted a little bit. And I do occasionally meet some public adjusters uh, on site in my claims because the insured has hired a public adjuster to represent them. So think about that. Uh, so number one, the policy or the public adjuster uh, works directly on behalf of poly policy holders. Okay, so think about it is that this public adjuster is saying, I solely, solely am looking out for the insured only. Now, think about that as far as how an insurance company would feel if you said uh, that you were a public adjuster. So typically that doesn't, doesn't make the insurance company feel really good about you because you're going to be on that side as a public adjuster. So if I was a public adjuster, I would be doing everything possible to find every single thing that potentially could be in that house. And I'm talking nitpicky. So I've been on uh, some jobs with some public adjusters and they'll look at the smallest little scrape. And that could be a branch that flew by three years ago that did damage to a screen. And they're going to say, yep, that's hail damage. And I'm like, well, hail doesn't cause a streak like that. You know, like cuts a line in, in the screen. And they'll be swearing up and down. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, we're going to add that out. If you don't add it, we're going to take you to court. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm serious. I mean, this is really just stupid. But anyway, so public adjusters are there to represent the insured. They do not work for the insurance company, and they don't care about the insured, insurance company. They care only about the insured. Now, care is kind of interesting, but let's, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So they also help businesses or individuals file insurance claims if a proposed settlement seems unfit from an insurer. Okay, so think about the fact that uh, if you kind of had a helper. So let's say you're, you're just not feeling very, you know, not feeling very, uh, you know, wise about how a claim process works, or maybe this is your first claim, and an insurance adjuster comes by and says, hey, don't get ripped off by the insurance company. Hire me and I'll help you. Okay, so that's how they kind of sell themselves. And in fact, when I was in Florida, uh, about every other billboard that was on, on, you know, as you're driving on the road is as a public adjuster. And what they're selling to a lot of times down in that area are people that don't speak English. And they're there to help. And, and trust me, I think it's a great service uh, for them to be, con, you know, to be concerned about making sure that uh, there's a communication, you know, area there that they can understand or they can go through it. 
But the flip side of it is, is that the public adjuster really has their own interest in mind. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So generally, public adjusters are also contract workers rather than salaried. So remember I talked about a staff adjuster? Well, staff adjuster is not uh, the same as a public adjuster. A public adjuster is, is self-employed and they take care of all their own businesses, tax expenses, and all that other stuff. Uh, but they are charging the insured, okay? Charging the insured for their services. That's where um, things get a little bit sticky and a little bit uh, not, so, uh, not so pleasant. So here's the big question. Should I hire a public adjuster? Well, it depends upon your circumstances. Incorrect information sometimes occurs when the independent adjuster or a staff adjuster inspects the claim. Items can be missed, okay? So that does happen sometimes, okay? So the public adjuster wants to make sure that he is there to, uh, to make sure that things aren't missed. Okay, now there are a, another set of eyes that will be present during that inspection. So when I go out to an inspection to inspect for the insured, the public adjuster will also show up. Now, with that arrangement with the public adjuster, I'm not allowed to speak to the insured. It's kind of like a lawyer representing someone. So they're not a lawyer, but they are representing them, the insured, to the insurance company. And all communication will go through the public adjuster. So I talk to the public adjuster. I can't really talk to the insured. I might say hello or whatever and tell them I'm here to inspect their house. But that's pretty much the extent of it. Uh, but they, uh, the public adjuster is another set of eyes. So sometimes it works out well. I mean, I, I think we, you know, the arrangement that I've had with most of the public adjusters is we, we make friends. We're good, we're good buddies. And I'm not there to be a jerk. And half the time, maybe they're not. But I have been on some very, very difficult uh, claims where they try to discredit me from the very beginning. I'll tell you a story. I was up in uh, Massachusetts on a catastrophe. And a big tree uh, came down and hit this uh, old 1920s house, third story. This monster tree was sitting on the ridge. Okay, so it, uh, it had done some damage, done some, a lot of damage. But being the house and built in the 1920s, it really didn't change the structure of the house. It just, you know, came for the roof. And it damaged the third story a bonus room, did a lot of mass water damage, whatever. Uh, so anyway, so when I first got on site, uh, the public adjuster introduced himself and he gave me a card and he had another guy there too. And uh, th their first goal was to be intimidating. They wanted to intimidate me. And uh, so I mentioned to him, I said, uh, well, I'm here, I'm an independent adjuster. And he goes, yeah, and so uh, how much experience do you have? I mean, that was the first question besides saying hello, saying hello was he was in my face. And he was just like, so how much experience do you have? And I was like, well, um, you know, been doing this a little while and uh, also was a general contractor for 18 years. So got a little bit of experience. Um, and he goes, oh, and he said, well, most of the time they send out people that don't know what they're doing. And I said, well, apparently at this time they didn't. <laughs> so anyways, I thought that might end the, uh, the confrontation, but it didn't. This guy was such a jerk. And every moment that we went through the house, so what are you going to do there? was his first question or second question and third question. You know, and he was constantly just second guessing me and following me around like a, like a wasp. <laughs> it was just terrible. So finally, after a little while, uh, you know, I just told him, I said, you know, uh, you catch a whole lot more f uh, flies with honey. You know, and I just, you know, and he kind of looked at me like, oh, what are you trying to say? And I said, well, I, I said, you're, you're kind of harsh. And, uh, you know, I don't know that that's going to be a, you know, a relationship that I want to continue if you're going to be harsh. And he goes, well, I'm just trying to make sure you know what you're doing. And I said, well, I think I've given you a pretty good idea that we've been on the same page. Um, you know, most of the times you've asked me a question, we've been on the same page for what kind of damage I was going to write up. So anyway, so that was my experience with a really bad uh, public adjuster. And it ended up, uh, I think our estimates were, like, it was about $80,000 in damage. And I think well, we were only about 5000 off. So, and there was just some hidden damage that we couldn't have seen. But anyway, so it was a, a great experience as far as my estimate coming in pretty close. But uh, as far as the experience on site, it was not very pleasant. All right. So, uh, well, here's the thing that uh, 
that uh, I think it needs to be the red flag for a public adjuster. They normally work on a percentage of the settlement figure rather than being paid a regular salary. You will get less than what you expected. Okay, so did you hear that? They work on a percentage of what you actually get. So back on that $80,000 estimate, uh, I have seen public adjusters receive 20% of the settlement as their fee. Okay, so think about that. 20% of $80,000. That's a lot of money. Okay, now that is not the norm, but I would say 10% is probably a, a very strong figure and that might even be a little low, but they're going to take 10% minimum, maybe fee-based, depending on, you know, some people are different. Now, I'm not trying to group all public adjusters as being bad, but there are some pretty nasty ones out there. And they take a very large portion of that settlement for uh, their services. So what happens is when that insurer comes back, gets their check, it, it immediately goes to the public adjuster, and then the adjuster takes his fee out and then sends the remaining to the, to the customer. Uh, to the insured. So the downside is because they don't speak English or maybe there's some language breakdown or maybe the, you know, the intelligence level of, or not intelligence, it's just understanding the claim process doesn't make sense. They're looking at their check and they're going, now I got $80,000 worth of damage, but I only got 65,000 here. How am I going to fix the house? Well, that's not my problem. Uh, you hired me for my services and I got you $80,000. You know, that insurance company would have only given you 60. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, we, we got you a lot more. So typically those are tough questions, um, tough conversations that occur afterwards. And a lot of people are very disappointed with the results after they've used a public adjuster. Now there are some great experiences as well. So I don't want to, again, don't want to bad mouth the public adjuster, but they, um, they have a vested interest in their own uh, pockets most of the time. So you're going to want to be really careful. So another point of whether I should hire a public adjuster is that your claim can be significantly delayed. Okay, they are very busy and you cannot speak to the claims department about your claim when you have a public adjuster. They are representing you. So one of the things that I have noticed is that when I schedule a claim, so I get a call in or a claim delivered to me and it, and it has a public adjuster assigned to it. One of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, I typically like to schedule things out about two or three days at the longest out uh, as far as scheduling. But one of the things that I've noticed, and this is very consistent, very consistent, is a, is a lot of times those claims are delayed about a week. That's the first available appointment they have is about a week out. So, you know, again, I haven't talked to the insured and I don't know, maybe he is contacting them and telling them about this delay, but a lot of times it's, it's delayed. Now the flip side goes on the desk adjuster side. So let's say the desk adjuster calls up and has a question about the estimate they received from the public adjuster. Well, the adjuster a lot of times is very busy, so he's not answering his phone calls and he's putting it to voicemail. So there's a delay. So then maybe he doesn't return the call because he's got 20 others. Maybe he's even got a few complaints from some prior clients. Uh, you know, his voicemail's full or, you know, just, just is not really faithful to return those calls. That desk adjuster again calls and leaves a message and two or three days passes again. Well, if I was dealing with the desk adjuster dealing directly with the insured, I call them up, leave a message, and they're excited because they're like, yeah, I want to find out what my claim is, and they call right back. And, and maybe the, you know, within an hour, you get a call back, and you find out about your claim, and you're all done. So it's, it's different when you work with, with a public adjuster. All right, so I think I'm going to stop there. Um, my uh, next topic, uh, in fact, I went... Uh, uh, really long about what uh, what is an insurance adjuster and the three types of uh, insurance adjusters. Uh, the next topic that I'm going to get into, and I hope you'll stick around for me, and it's very informative, uh, lots of information. I mean, again, I, I told you guys this at the beginning that we would have a ton of information, 
And so I wanted to at least give you a chance to uh, to experience that, knowing that there was going to be a lot of a lot of adjust a lot of adjusting information. So uh, that being said, our next topic. Uh, is what does a claim adjuster do? What does he do? Okay, so that as you can see from my first uh, videos here that, uh, well actually not my introduction, but now my second episode, um, I go into a lot of detail. Okay, so I do explain a lot of things and uh, uh, I do go into a lot of detail. Uh, so I, I want you to know that I'm gonna do exactly the same thing when it comes to what does an adjuster do. Um, so thank you for uh, joining me. I really appreciate it. I'm going to leave some links uh, down below, uh, some information regarding uh, where I got my information from. And also most of it, though, is, is firsthand experience. So I, I just I want you to know that, uh, that I am not giving you information just walking around and saying, hmm, I want to be an adjuster. What does that mean? Uh, I'm doing this from firsthand experience. I'm hoping to teach you guys everything you need to know uh, before you go into this job so that you will know uh, what you're getting into and then also how to uh, to be successful at it because that's my hope is that uh, I see a lot of adjusters that are, are decent and I see a lot of adjusters that could probably use a little more training and I hope that uh, through this training that you will gain insight and knowledge and wisdom to become the best adjuster that you could be uh, that you'll use this resource uh, to keep going back to and refreshing your memory and refreshing uh, areas that you need to work on uh, so that you'll continue to hone your skills and, and be uh, the best you can be. So uh, I really appreciate you guys coming. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to, to comment below. Uh, leave me questions. I'd love to, to hear what you guys think since this is new. And uh, maybe you're thinking, hey, this guy is really boring. <laughs> I mean, our first video had a lot more stuff going on with, you know, fancy little icons and all that stuff. And, you know, I'm still working through that process to, to make it exciting and fun, but not be boring. Uh, but I also want to, to hear from you folks, because to me, I feel like if an adjuster calls me up and says, hey, can you, uh, can you talk about this uh, money thing a little bit more? And, uh, you know, tell me how I make my money and, or, or do you have any insight on, on taxes or, you know, I, I can't give you tax advice, but, <laughs> but I can certainly help uh, you, you know, direct you to some of the resources that I use. Uh, but I think that's what I want to do. If I think through this whole video is uh, I've been very successful at this. Uh, not all by my own doing. I'm going to go into that a little bit too, is explaining that I had mentors. I had people just like myself um, that I want to I want to be a mentor to people now, uh, now that I've succeeded in this. And I'm going to do this for a long time. I'm not giving up this career. I'm going to be doing this until I die. I really enjoy it and I think it's a great career. But I also want to be a mentor to those, to pay back to those guys that were a mentor to me. I can remember... Uh, uh, sitting on a catastrophe uh, uh, on the hotel balcony, just dying. I mean, just just like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just, it's crazy. I mean, what am I going to do? And uh, I called up this one guy and I just said, hey, man, I said, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do in this situation. And he was there and he and he walked me through it and he sat down at the computer and he, he said, hey, Daniel, he said, just, just do this. If you would do this, I think you'll understand this part and you just write this and, and it, there's that thing that you were missing and you know, he walked me through it. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. You're the best. And I think I called him back about three more times that same day. <laughs> it was just, I was like, oh, I can't remember how to do this. But he helped me and the same with two other guys. And you know, I, that's what the kind of person that I wanna be to, to you guys is to feel like you're, uh, you're there, you're there, you're trying to get started. Um, you want to be successful, but you also want to know what you're getting into. And then you also have a lot of questions. So I hope that this video series will be uh, just an opportunity to answer those questions. And if I miss something, uh, then maybe we can address it in a future video. So uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, click that bell also. That'll also get you an alert when one comes up. I know I'm a little bit late on getting this one up because uh, there was lots of technical stuff. I'm trying to figure out my lighting. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> my background, you know, this is just trying to figure that out. Um, this microphone being in my face, I'm still trying to figure out how to feel good about that and uh, all the stuff, the tech stuff. It's, uh, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on when you're, when you're starting up. Uh, but anyways, uh, in below in the links also, also uh, my Instagram page. You know what's really interesting about Instagram is I love photography and I, I'm not going to claim to be a photographer so that I, don't, I want to get past that 
but I just feel like I've found a, a love for beauty and uh, seem to be able to pick out things and see things a little differently than I thought I could. And I've had a lot of people comment on uh, my photos and saying they're really beautiful. So uh, I'm going to leave a link to my Instagram and uh, hope you'll check out some of those photos and like them and, and maybe follow me because I, I, I really feel like, you know, if you love nature and you love what drones, I, I do a lot of stuff with drones there. Uh, so just be able to see things from a different perspective. Uh, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy that. And then I have a Twitter feed. I'm going to leave that as well. Just getting started with that. That's my adjuster side. Uh, not a whole lot with drone stuff on there, but um, not, not a whole lot of stuff going on. But that's where I post a lot of stuff with adjuster stuff. And then also I have a link for my web page as well. Uh, so anyways, thank you so much, guys. I'm so excited to be a part of this. And I uh, hope that you'll find this interesting and you'll, uh, you'll learn something. Because that's all we can do is learn and grow together. So... Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.